President Abdel Fattah Sisi described ties between Cairo and New Delhi as strong and historical. The president was speaking during a summit meeting with the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi at the Itahadeh Presidential Palace in Cairo on Sunday. Receiving an invitation from the Indian Prime Minister to participate in the upcoming G20 summit in New Delhi, the president said he was confident that India active leadership in the group will help contain the repercussions of international challenges on the global economy. President Sisi added that Egypt is ready to cooperate with the Indian presidency of G20 to push talks in constructive track and help reach the optimal method for dealing with energy crisis, climate change and food shortages. Modi arrived on a two-day visit to Cairo on Saturday upon an invitation from the president who paid a state visit to New Delhi in, on last January. It is Modi's first trip to Egypt since assuming power in 2014 and the first for an Indian Prime Minister since 1997. It also coincides with the 75th anniversary of establishing diplomatic relations between Egypt and India. Presidential spokesperson Councillor Ahmed Fahmi said the summit talks asserted keenness by both sides to expand ties in all fields, especially IT, pharmaceuticals, higher education, vaccine, energy and trade. The meeting also discussed strengthening cultural ties through launching direct flights between Cairo and New Delhi and increasing the volume of trade between the two sides. This is in addition to talks between the two leaders dealing with regional and international files. Following the summit, the President and India's Prime Minister signed a joint declaration of raising relations to the level of strategic partnership. The President also conferred the Order of the Nile, the highest Egyptian order, to the Indian Prime Minister. As part of the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's current visit to Egypt, Prime Minister Mustafa Bouli accompanied him over a tour at the Giza Pyramids on Sunday. The Indian Prime Minister posed for photos at the historic place and listened to an explanation of its unique value. Later on, the Prime Minister presented the visiting Indian leader with a replica of King Tut's golden mask as a souvenir that represents the great Egyptian civilization. Also during the tour, Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, Dr. Mustafa Waziri, had received Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Sunday at Al Hakim Mosque in Cairo. Waziri took the Indian Prime Minister and his accompanying delegation on a tour of the mosque, during which he reviewed the history of the mosque and its archaeological values. He also gave briefs of the restoration project carried out by the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities in cooperation with the Ministry of Awqaf and uh, Bohra community that uh, was uh, completed and opened last Friday, rather February. At the end of the tour, Dr. Waziri offered the Indian uh, Prime Minister uh, an ancient Egyptian model of a boat in appreciation and cooperation between Egypt and India. And joining us over the phone to tell us more about uh, the uh, Prime Minister's visit to Egypt is His Excellency Mr. Ambassador Ajit Gupta, of, uh, uh, the Ambassador of India to Cairo. Uh, good evening to you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, good evening. Good evening. How Thank you? you so much for joining us over the phone. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, welcome. could you tell us a bit about uh, the significance of this visit? Uh, it is uh, the first of its kind in many, many years. Uh, why is this something that is significant for the Indian Prime Minister? <clears throat> Yes. Uh, well, uh, uh, the last bilateral visit by an Indian Prime Minister to Egypt uh, took place as long ago as 1997. And uh, in 2009, our Prime Minister had visited uh, Sharm el Sheikh, but that was for the Non Aligned Movement Summit. So it is after many, many years that we have a visit from our Prime Minister. This was also the first visit of uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, to Egypt. Uh, and it was uh, a return visit. Uh, uh, President Sisi had been to India in January 2023 yes. on a state visit as the chief guest for our Republic Day celebrations. 
Uh, sir, uh, the uh, President Abdel Fattah Sisi, along with Prime Minister Narendra Modi, they spoke in depth about different uh, various uh, cooperations that they could fulfill uh, in the next period, uh, including increasing trade and exchange when it comes to the pharmaceutical sector, higher education, IT, uh, medical fields as well. Uh, what will be the focus uh, for uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi when it comes to uh, uh, exchange and trade with Egypt? Well, uh, first of all, both India and Egypt are two of the greatest ancient civilizations who have maintained their contacts for thousands of years. And in the last few decades, uh, even though there have been major changes in mm -hmm. international relations, uh, both India and Egypt have maintained uh, very friendly uh, ties. And we share a similar view on many global issues. Uh, secondly, uh, the cooperation between India and Egypt has been growing in many fields in the last few years. Uh, our bilateral trade has expanded by 75% last year to reach a record high of $7.26 billion. Yes. Uh, we have had a number of defense delegations coming uh, to Egypt and also going from Egypt to India. And yes. India is emerging as a very important source of investment. In Egypt, our companies have already invested about 3.3 billion U.S. dollars, and many other companies are looking at investing additional amounts in Egypt. So keeping in mind the multifaceted development of our ties, yes. uh, both countries uh, have elevated the relationship to a strategic partnership, and this is the most significant outcome of uh, Prime Minister Modi's visit. Uh, sir, the uh, Prime Minister had visited several archaeological sites and historical sites in Egypt. Uh, what uh, was the opinion of the Prime Minister visiting these areas? And would it be the first time for him to actually visit it, even if it's on an unofficial visit as well? Sorry, first visit to? Prime Minister Narendra Modi had visited several archaeological and historical sites during his uh, state visit. Uh, what uh, were the uh, views seen by the Prime Minister from uh, uh, these visits? How did he receive it? Yes. So you see, uh, Prime Minister uh, has acknowledged in many of his statements that India and Egypt are ancient civilizations, uh, that our contacts go back to more than 4,000 years, which is something mm -hmm. very, very rare and unique. And both countries have a number of uh, priceless uh, archaeological sites, uh, historic monuments, yes. uh, which need to be preserved and they need to be presented and showcased to not only the people of the respective countries, but also for the rest of the world. Yes. And he feels that this is an area where uh, India and Egypt uh, should collaborate uh, and cooperate more closely. Yes, uh, uh, sir. Well, New Delhi is also going to host uh, the G20 summit, and upon an invitation from Prime Minister Narendra Modi, uh, the Egyptian President uh, Abdel Fattah Sisi will also be attending. Uh, how is the G20 summit going to be significant and important when it comes to facing global economic challenges? Can, can you repeat the question? I, I can't, uh, I can't quite... Uh, New Delhi is expected to host a G20 summit and, and President Abdel mm. Fattah Sisi had been invited uh, uh, upon mm. uh, the invitation from the Prime Minister of India. Right. Um, sir, how do you see the importance of the new or the upcoming uh, G20 summit when it comes to facing global challenges given the repercussions of a number of major factors right. that affected the global economy? Right. So, you see... <clears throat> Uh, during India's uh, presidency of the G20, we have invited nine partner countries uh, who are mostly from representatives of the de among the developing countries. And we have invited Egypt as one of the partner countries. We are very happy that Egypt has sent a number of ministers <coughs> to take part in various G20 meetings uh, and is taking part with a lot of enthusiasm in the various G20 activities. Uh, India recognizes that Egypt is a very important uh, country in the region because of its strategic location, that it is a leader of the Arab world, and that Egypt uh, has the ability to articulate and reflect the concerns of countries in this part of the world. And India, as president of the G20, we would like to uh, provide a platform to developing countries to express their grievances uh, and their issues 
to the G20 countries. Okay, uh, Sir, Mr. Ambassador, His Excellency, um, Sir Ambassador Ajita Gupte of uh, uh, the Ambassador of India to Egypt, thank you so much for joining us over the phone. We're going to uh, take a short break and move on with the rest of the episode. And uh, President Abdel Fattah Sisi addressed on Friday the closing session of the summit for a new global financing pact in Paris. During his speech, the president stressed the importance of developing countries, that developing countries rather, should adopt creative ideas to face climate change, noting that Egypt is keen on carrying out clean energy projects. The president said that Egypt has cooperated with Germany in the project of electric trains in the framework of sustainable development projects as well as facing factors of climate change using modern means of transportation. President Ossisi added that, was, was, that what has been achieved rather during the last years is not sufficient to support the African countries in the face of climate change. The president also called for the participating countries in the summit to abide by their pledges and to take serious measures to carry them out. President Sisi added that the world has moved to face the repercussions of the coronavirus pandemic as well as the repercussions of the Russia-Ukraine crisis. The president stressed the importance of taking speed proceed, speedy procedures to face these challenges. In his address, the president also thanked the French president Emmanuel Macron for his support to Egypt as well as successfully hosting the summit for new global financing pact. And uh, joining us over the phone uh, to tell us more about the visit of the Indian Prime Minister to Egypt is uh, Dr. Noha Bakr, a political analyst. Uh, good evening to you, ma'am. Good evening, and it's a pleasure to be with you. And Thank you so much, and uh, uh, we're happy to you and the entire family. Um, could you tell us a bit about the significance of having uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi visiting Egypt? This is uh, considered the first in many, many years. The last visiting Prime Minister was in 1997. Why is this something that is significant when it comes to Indian-Egyptian relations? Also, this today's visit is the first visit to him, for him, or His Excellency, to Egypt since he took office in 2014. Yes. So during this visit, His Excellency actually um, uh, held several meetings with a number of senior Egyptian officials and met also with the Indian community in Cairo. Yes. So it was a purely official visit to Egypt and also to the Indians in the diaspora in Cairo. Uh, actually, at, at the beginning of this year, the Egyptian-Indian relations entered a new stage. It's a stage that, uh, the, w that's different from the historical ties and diplomatic relations that date to 75 years ago. Yes. It's the new stage is a stage of strategic partnership between the two countries, between the two old civilizations in the world. Actually, this strategic partnership was mm -hmm. announced during President Sisi's historic visit to New Delhi. Mm -hmm. And there is significance to this visit where the president arrived as the chief guest at the Republic Day celebration. And this yes. has a significant and a meaning, a meaning of the, 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 the good relationship, the strong bilateral relationship, and also the appreciation of, of, of the Indian system and the Indian people to Egypt uh, leadership and to the Egyptians. Um, they also talked about uh, expanding ties in different fields, including uh, our information technology, pharmaceuticals, higher education, and uh, uh, as well as vaccines and energy trade. Um, how important is it that we increase the volume of trade? We know that uh, India is a very powerful contender when it comes to pharmaceuticals. They're very well known for their pharmaceutical products. Is this going to be helpful? Uh, for the Egyptian economy when it comes to expanding these ties? Actually, the, the, the development of the relation recently and this visit uh, uh, has an economic significance, but there were also a, a, a very important visit prior to that that has a security significance. Yes. 
Yes. When it comes to the security significance, the, the visit of the Indian Defense Minister last September to Cairo, where there were memorandum of understanding of military cooperation was signed, an agreement to support military and security relations, training, neutral training, and combative terrorists, this was very important. Also, this visit is also important. Let, let's yes. look at the figures. Actually, there was an unprecedented boom during the recent period at the volume of trade between Egypt and India. It has increased by 75% in 2021-22, reaching yes. its highest level ever and amounting to 7.26 billion uh, and continues to grow in the in, for this year. Also, Egyptian export to India amounted to 1.5 mm. billion during the first 10 months of 2022. Mm. And the volume of Egyptian imports from India recorded 3.7 billion during the first 10 months. We're talking about two huge nations and demographically also very population, populated nations that can exchange lots of goods and also can benefit from the, from the know-how and technology mm -hmm. of this that exists on the economy. But also there is something very important. Um, has applied to join the BRICS group. Yes. which is the most important matter at this time in light of the group's strategic importance and influence. And actually, uh, India has been supporting Egypt's request to join the BRICS. So this is also another thing to be added to the relation uh, on the economic side. On food security, yes. we shouldn't just forget that India has excluded Egypt from, uh, f from the decision to ban the export of Indian wheat uh, when, when, when the situation started to be tight when it comes to e the, the needs of the na Egyptian nation for wheat because mm -hmm. of the Ukrainian war and the fact that Ukraine and Russia was one of the two areas that Egypt used to, or two countries that Egypt used to import grains in general and wheat in specific. As we know, Egypt is the highest yes. in importing wheat. So actually, India um, uh, giving this privilege to Egypt is very important when it comes to the food security and to the economy in general. Yes. Um, do you think that also the fact that uh, the uh, Egyptian, both the Egyptian and the Indian side are trying to expand uh, their means of cooperation is a way to also tap into different markets whereas uh, where Egypt would be able through India to tap into the Asian market and India uh, on the other hand could also tap into the rest of the African continent? Exactly. With the free trade agreement for Africa, Egypt could be the access to, to, to India, to the African country. Mm. Uh, the, 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 here we're talking about a situation where we have South-South cooperation, and it is very important. Mm. Two countries that are working hard on sustainable development goals, on yes. their development in, in, in specific, and their cooperation together, not only in, in, in trade, but in exchanging knowledge, in exchanging technology. We know how developed India is in exchanging in the IT. Yes. All this can help in, in in the two nations to support each other for the best of 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 our region, of and on the bilateral level for the two countries. Um, there's also the G20 summit that is expected to take place in New Delhi, and uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi had invited President Abdel Fattah Sisi to attend the G20 summit. How important is it that Egypt represents in the G20? Exactly. This is also something very important and Egypt is keen on. Uh, and I think that um, uh, India's invitation to Egypt at the G20 summit is an, as a major partner from outside the group at, at, at the level heads of state government, which in, India will host next September, is mm -hmm. also very important to Egypt and, and reflects the, the strategic partnership and, and the strategic ties between the two countries. Okay, Dr. Mohab Akhra, political analyst, thank you so much for joining us over the phone. We're going to take a short break and move on with the rest of the episode. Back to the summit in France, where on the sidelines of the summit for new global financing pacts, in Paris, President Abdel Fattah Sisi had met on Friday with South African President Cyril Ramaphosa. During the meeting, the President confirmed Egypt's keenness to develop bilateral relations as well as cooperation with South Africa in various fields. For his part, the South African President praised the bilateral relations, stressing his country's keenness to boost bilateral cooperation 
with Egypt. He also praised the role of Egypt and the effort in the African arena. Also during the meeting, they tackled regional issues of mutual concern, including the crisis in Sudan. President El-Sisi had also met with uh, other leaders, including the Kenyan President William Roto. And during the meeting, the President praised the strong bilateral relations, joint cooperation with Kenya, adding that Egypt is looking forward to boosting relations and cooperate with Kenya in all fields. For his part, the Kenyan President praised the historical relations with Egypt, stressing Kenya's keenness to develop bilateral cooperation and increase the trade exchange between the two countries. The meeting also tackled regional issues of mutual concern, including the crisis in Sudan, where the two leaders agreed to intensify consultation and coordination to find a solution to the crisis. President El Sisi also met with French economy and finance minister Bruno Le Maire. And during the meeting, the president has said Egypt is looking forward to developing joint cooperation with France in the economic and development field, especially through increasing French investments in Egypt. For his part, the French minister stressed his country's keenness to boost and develop processes in Egypt, stressing France's support to the projects of the French companies in Egypt. Still on the summit, French President Emmanuel Macron said on Friday that wealthy nations had finalized an overdue $100 billion climate financing pledge to developing countries and created a fund for biodiversity and protection of forests. Macron was speaking at the closing session of the summit for a new global financing pact in Paris, where world leaders had gathered to give impetus to a new global finance agenda. The leaders participating in the summit said in a statement that multilateral development banks are expected to unlock an additional $200 billion in lending to by running their balance sheets more tightly and taking more risks. The statement added that if these reforms are implemented, multilateral development banks may need more capitals. Joining us over the phone to tell us more about the summit is uh, Ambassador Gamal Bayoumi, the former assistant to the foreign minister. Good evening to you, Mr. Ambassador. Good evening. How are you? Thank you for joining us. Uh, sir, could you tell us a bit about uh, the uh, summit itself? Why was it significant for Egypt to participate in such a summit? A very important summit because uh, uh, the issue of finance is the issue of today. We, we left finance yes. in our uh, African continent, the whole developing countries are in mm. great need of finance for several reasons, of course, to finance their uh, mm -hmm. uh, economic uh, projects. Also, the new issue is environment. And since we had the, the COP27 in Charm yes. we started to search for new finance because the gap between our uh, aim and the possible finance now is very big. Yes. And uh, we are suffering that uh, the African continent, the flow of money from the African continent to the developed countries is much more than it receives. Mm -hmm. We pay our debts, we pay our invoices of imports much more than, than we receive of uh, investment or we receive for our exports. And we cannot continue like that because we are not rich countries after all. Uh, so the, the, this is the main issue mm. of the Paris uh, conference. And the, the good thing that uh, our case is fair enough that everybody is trying to help, especially the International Monetary Organization, yes. IMF and the World Bank, and the international financial organization. Even the donors also are keen to help. But the promises yes. are much more than the implementation. That's why we need always to follow yes. up and to see that uh, the uh, commitments we receive in a conference like that yes. are uh, on the table and we receive uh, enough money 
of that conflict like that. Uh, sir, but uh, you're saying that these are just promises, but Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, had also spoke during the summit about uh, them finalizing, or the wealthy nations, finalizing the $100 billion uh, uh, climate change uh, fund pledge. Uh, does that not mean that it is something that will be actionable very soon? Uh, of course, everybody agreed upon the sum of $100 billion which we need to finance our new uh, agenda. Yes. But uh, c c can we collect it or not? This is another question. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, uh, to be honest, I must encourage ourselves on the uh, receiving countries in order to do what I call uh, our homework. Of course, we are asking for finance. On the other hand, we need to encourage those who are coming to invest in our countries to feel easier, to feel that they, are, they do not waste uh, their time because we, we, we still have to make our uh, bureaucracy mm -hmm. much faster. We need to uh, adopt new uh, financial uh, system, banking system also. We need to uh, help our infrastructure whether it is road or ports or any means of transport and so on. So it is a, a, a little complicated issue. But I, I think that the, the map is quite clear yes. to those who are dealing with Yes. Uh, also, President Abdel Fattah Sisi had met during the sidelines, or on the sidelines, rather, of the uh, summit itself with a number of uh, different uh, leaders, including uh, uh, the uh, President of Kenya and South Africa as well, in addition to French officials. Why were these meetings very important uh, for the Egyptian side to talk with the African leaders specifically? Uh, I, I'm highly satisfied because now we, we gain as diplomacy, Egyptian diplomacy, the level of our presidency is everywhere. And it is a good occasion for Egypt and for our president in order to meet his counterparts of the other leaders. Also, he met with some leaders of uh, international companies. This is very good for Egypt, for the case of environment, for the case of investment. And uh, this is the occasion in order to catch the opportunities yes. and to show. It is a sort, I always call it, it is a sort of showroom to show our cases, to show our ability yes. to offer uh, possibilities for investment and so on. So yes. th this is what is happening in this conference and in all uh, uh, conferences where our president is participating. Yes, uh, sir. Also, uh, the president had met with the uh, finance and economy minister of France, uh, uh, Bruno Le Maire, uh, and they spoke about expanding and uh, entrenching the uh, f French finances or French investments rather here in Egypt. Um, there are a lot of multinational French companies located right now here in Egypt. How can this be expanded when it comes to investments in Egypt? And what are the functions of these, uh, or the nature of these investments in Egypt? This is another dimension of those meetings, because now you are talking about the bilateral uh, relations between Egypt and France. Mm -hmm. And of course, as you will know, France is uh, one of the largest economies in Europe, where we have a very good uh, agreement Mm -hmm. the association agreement between Egypt and mm -hmm. European Union. And uh, on top of this agreement, there is France, Germany, Italy. They mm -hmm. are our main trade partners. Yes. They are our main uh, investor also. And we always, when we talk about France, we, we, we talk immediately about the infrastructure and the underground because we were lucky to have the first underground in our area and in the Arab world, mm -hmm. uh, thanks to the French uh, relations. And we are enlarging this also. Also, France is helping us in the field of telecommunication. In yes, the they launched our satellite, didn't they? Yes, and uh, uh, one other side that France is one very big importer, importer of our agricultural products. Yes. And now we are becoming one of the largest exporters of uh, uh, food uh, products yes. and especially in the agricultural field and we, we make a, a sort of a, a story of success in this yes. field 
Mind you that we are exporting something around 1 million tons of uh, potatoes, and each ton needs four workers. Yes. So you, you, uh, in a relation like that, you are uh, creating millions of, of jobs, and this is exactly what we need in our actual situation. Yes, were, were there also possibilities of expanding cooperation when it comes to uh, uh, natural gas, given what's happening with Ukraine and Russia and Europe being uh, unable to uh, compensate the gas that they're missing out from Russia? Do you believe that uh, uh, Egypt could be a supplier of this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's quite uh, good, your uh, remark that everything is on the table and we are discussing all the possibilities to attract more trade, more investment, and yes. I do not neglect at all the presence of uh, uh, thousands of Egyptians yes. working in Europe in general and in France and Germany, the, the majority of our uh, people working mm. there. And uh, now it is a source of our uh, foreign uh, resources uh, of dollars, of euros. Uh, this is the main revenue coming yes. to the Egyptian banking system through uh, our community in Europe. We have more than one million inhabitants living in Europe, and they are working in a very suitable uh, uh, environment, and they are well received. Yes. Now we are uh, really, Egypt is quite well known that it is a country without any problem concerning what we call the illegal migration. Yes. Europe is always thanking us about that. So uh, many, many, many uh, dimensions of this relation. Yes. And each dimension, it, it brings more and more uh, prosperity for the Egyptian people and for the Egyptian economy. Yes, uh, Mr. Ambassador, my question would be also about the gas, natural gas, sending natural gas to Europe. Uh, could uh, France be some sort of gateway to the rest of Europe for our natural gas? Thank God that we are lucky. It's not only that we are clever, but also we are lucky because the discoveries of gas in the last few years in uh, the Mediterranean Yes. It is very good, especially in the Egyptian economic zone. And now we, we are in a position to export not gas, but all the source of energy, whether it's gas, oil, and electricity. Yes. At this moment, we are establishing an electricity line between Egypt and Greece and Cyprus, where we shall supply Europe with electricity, also with gas, because we are importing gas because we have two yes. factories in Damiet and R Rashid to uh, liquidate the gas. And this is a, a highly uh, uh, addition to our economy because the, the, the price of the liquid gas is much more than the gas itself. So we are in a position, of course, to help Europe in this field. Yes. Thank God, and Europe is appreciating this very much. Okay, Ambassador Gamal Bayoumi, the former assistant to the foreign minister, thank you so much for thank joining you. us over the phone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a short break and move on with the rest of the episode. Moscow was striving Monday to portray a return of business as usual after a weekend mutiny by mercenary troops threatening, threatened Kremlin chief Vladimir Putin uh, grip on power. Defense Minister Sergei Shoigo, one of the main targets of Wagner warlord Yevgeny Prozgen's revolt, appeared on state television inspecting troops in Ukraine. Officials in Moscow and in the Voronze region south of the capital lifted anti-terrorist emergency security measures imposed to protect the capital from rebel assault. Putin himself has yet to appear in public since the revolt ended and Prozegny has last seen on Saturday leaving the southern city of Rostov-on-Don in an armed Wagner convoy. Moscow Mayor Sergei Sobyanin proclaimed the situation in the city stable and thanked the Moscovites for their claim and calm rather, and understanding during the crisis. 
Also on Saturday, with Wagner columns bearing down on the capital and clashes with regular forces in Bosnia bordering Ukraine, a counter-terrorist regime had been ordered. Ending their mutiny, Russian mercenaries of the Wagner Group headed back to their barracks and bases in return for guarantees for their safety under a Belarus-brokered deal. The deal halted the rapid advances on Moscow but left unanswered questions about President Vladimir Putin's grip on power. Here's the story. Wagner mercenaries headed back to their base on Sunday after Russian President Vladimir Putin agreed to allow their leader to avoid treason charges and accept exile in neighboring Belarus. The agreement halted an extraordinary crisis, an army led by Yevgeny Prigozhin trying to storm Moscow. Security measures were still in place in Moscow on Sunday, though fewer police were visible. Prigozhin's exact whereabouts remain unclear. He was last seen late Saturday in an SUV leaving Rostov-on-Don, where his fighters had seized a military headquarters. Trucks carrying armored vehicles with fighters on them followed his car. The crisis was the culmination of his feud with the Russian military stop brass. Putin had, on Saturday, denounced the revolt as treason, vowing to punish the perpetrators. He accused them of pushing Russia to the brink of civil war. However, later, the same day, he had accepted an agreement brokered by Belarus to avert Moscow's most serious security crisis in decades. Ukrainian leader Volodymyr Zelensky and U.S. President Joe Biden discussed the revolt on Sunday ahead of a NATO summit in Lithuania next month. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said on Sunday that the turmoil caused by the challenge to the authority of Russian President Vladimir Putin by Wagner fighters may not be over yet and could take weeks or months to play out. Blinken told CBS News that Russia's crisis involving the attempted revolt exposed real cracks in Putin's authority after he was forced into an amnesty deal. The remarks were the first public declarations about the developments in Russia by the United States, which over the past 24 hours had been intensively engaged in consultations with European allies on the revolt. Back to the Middle East, Israeli settlers' violence in the occupied West Bank persisted Monday with burning attacks on Palestinian agriculture produce. In the West Bank village of uh, Tamzil Aya, north of Ramallah. Also, Israeli occupation forces detained three Palestinian miners in a raid in the northern Palestinian city of Nablus. The latest incident adds to mounting tensions, which has cost 16 Palestinian lives across the territory since Monday. Palestinians have described hundreds of Israelis attacking their villages in recent days after Palestinian gunmen killed uh, four Israelis near the West Bank settlement on Tuesday. The Palestinian Foreign Ministry called for holding Israelis accountable for failure to provide protection to Palestinian civilians in the occupied territories. of business and finance a fund backed by Japan's government has offered rather offered to buy out a firm central uh, to the manufacturing of semiconductors in a deal worth 6.2 billion dollars the company uh, made the statement Monday it said its board was in favor of the deal which would privatize a company that is a key producer of compounds vital to the manufacturing of semiconductors.
The ruble and most equity markets sank Monday as traders kept watch on Russia following an aborted mutiny over the weekend. Events also added to unease on trading floors where investors last week reversed a recent rally in stocks owing to concerns about ever-rising interest rates amid aimed rather at fighting stubborn inflation. The ruble sank to 87 to the dollar, its weakest level since March last year, in early days Putin's invasions of Ukraine as traders reacted to the developments in Russia. Bloomberg said banks had priced it as, mu as much as 100 to the dollar at one point on Saturday before coming back as Progazine halted his advance to Moscow. On equity markets, traders appeared to take the events in stride, though most major indices were in the red. Hong Kong, Tokyo, Sydney, Shanghai, Taipei, Bangkok, Mumbai and Wellington all slipped. Oh, Seoul, Singapore, Manila and Jakarta rose. London, Paris and Frankfurt all fell in opening trade. In the world of science and technology, the tragedy of the Ocean Gate submarine, the U.S. Coast Guard said Sunday it had launched an investigation into the cause of the underwater implosion that destroyed the small submersible Titan with the loss of all five people aboard during a dive to the Titanic wreck. Here's the story. The Coast Guard said it had created a Marine Board of Investigation, MBI, its highest level of probe for this drama and ultimately tragedy in the North Atlantic that drew worldwide attention. The U.S. probe could also make recommendations on the possible pursuit of civil or criminal sanctions as necessary. Titan that was reported missing last Sunday and the Coast Guard said Thursday that all five people aboard the submersible had died after the vessel suffered a catastrophic implosion. A debris field was found on the seafloor 1,600 feet, 500 meters before the bow of the Titanic, which sits more than four kilometers below the ocean's surface. Canada, which helped in the search of the submersible, said Saturday it was carrying out its own probe. The Canadian flag polar princess, uh, rather, Prince cargo vessel towed the Titan out of the sea last weekend but lost contact with it about an hour and 45 minutes after the submersible launched into the ocean depths. Canadian authorities on Saturday began a probe into the implosion of the Titan submersible whose disappearance near the wreckage of the Titanic with five men aboard had set off a multinational search and rescue operation. The desperate search for a missing submersible near the wreck of the Titanic entered critical juncture on Thursday when air was expected to run out for the five people aboard. But officials vowed to continue scouring the remote North Atlantic. And after the Thursday, they had officially announced that the Titan had actually imploded in sea. And uh, the five days since the Titan began, what should have been a two-hour dive in the century-old shipwreck, a massive multinational hunt had taken place. Uh, the remotely operated vehicle deployed from a Canadian vessel reaching the ocean floor to begin searching. The U.S. Coast Guard said Thursday morning, while another robotic craft from a French research uh, center also pitched in, but to no avail, discovering the implosion. And in 
the world of sports, we start off with football, where into Miami's miserable run of form continued ahead of Lionel Messi's impending arrival with a 4-1 loss at Philadelphia. While there were wins for DC United and the New York Red Bulls in Major League Soccer. Miami suffered a seventh straight defeat and remained rock bottom of the Eastern Conference while United upset uh, Eastern Conference leader Cincinnati with a 3-0 home triumph. The Red Bulls also enjoyed a surprise 4-0 victory over Atlanta. Miami announced on Friday that former Spain and Barcelona midfielder Sergio Basquet was set to join Messi at the club in July. But the pair will have plenty to do if the club is to have any hope of making the postseason. And in tennis, Carlos Alcaraz believes he is capable of winning Wimbledon after claiming his first title on grass on Sunday by beating Alex Semenar 6-4, 6-4 in the final at Queen's Club. The Spaniard's fifth title of the season also takes him back to the top of the world rankings, but he said Novak Djokovic remains the favorite rather, to win Wimbledon for an eighth time next month. Alcaraz was playing on the grass for just the third tournament in his career and showed an impressive development through the week at Queen's after nearly falling to French lucky loser Arthur Randrich in the first round. The U.S. Open champion won his next four matches without dropping a set and is confident of going beyond the fourth round at Wimbledon for the first time. High Motorsports' Francis Sebastian Ogier won Kenya's Safari Rally on Sunday as Toyota swept the top four place for the second year in a row in the most grueling event of the calendar. The eight-time world champion, now racing part-time, beat championship leader Kaylee Rapamira of Finland by 6.7 seconds, with the Welshman Elfin Evans as a distant third and Japan's Takamoto Katutsa fourth. The win was Ogier's third for five starts so far this season, but he had to fight hard for it after overnight leads of 16.7 seconds was halved by reigning champion Raven Pora in the final day's opening stage. Ravon Pera extended his championship lead over Hyundai's Thierry Nobel to 37 points after 7 of 13 rounds with the Belgian finishing 8th. But bagging some precious bonus points in the fastest time in final power stage. The next round of the World Championship is in Estonia on July 20th to the 23rd. Well, this brings us to the end of the sports news uh, and this edition of Nile TV Newsroom. Thank you so much for watching and stay tuned here for more.